Praise the Lord, saints of God. Praise the Lord, saints of God. <laughs> Praise the Lord, saints of God. Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. Praise the Lord, saints of God. Praise the Lord in this place. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to stop till you praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord in this place. Give God some glory for he's worthy to be praised. Give God some glory because he's worthy to be praised. Praise the Lord. 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 Did you come here to give God praise today? Did you just come here to keep the seat warm? Come on, give God some praise. Oh, we serve a mighty good God. Y'all better praise him in this place. Oh, hallelujah, saints of God. Praise the Lord. God is good, and he's worthy of all our praise. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We serve a mighty 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 good God one who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think hallelujah in this place yeah. praise you praise you praise you God I don't know about you but I came on fire today because I serve that type of God See, if you only knew what I've been through, yeah, you would understand why I can't help but praise him. There is no shame in my game, and I'm all about that praise, all right? All right, all right, all right. Praise God, because he's worthy to be praised. To God. Who is my everything. I give honor and praise. Pulpit guests, my cousin Dr. Burke, God bless you, sir. Officers, members, friends, and mothers of Bethlehem Baptist Church. In case you haven't noticed, it's a good day. Oh, y'all don't act like you know it. It's it's a good day. <laughs> Whether you are the birth mother, godmother, dad mother, adoptive mother, stepmother, aunt mother, his mother, her mother, the mother of a mother, or simply sitting beside a mother, today is a good day. It's a good day. And I can say that even though my mother is no longer here. 2022, November, my mom went home to be with the Lord. And I stand today because I'm a witness that God is able and God will see you through. Today is a good day. The text that was read in your hearing Matthew 15, 21 through 28. I'd like to read that just one more time from the New Century Version. Please remain seated as God's word is already blessed. And we acknowledge him as the author and the finisher of our faith. Verse 21 begins, Jesus left that place and went to the area of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that area came to Jesus and cried out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter has a demon and she is suffering very much. But Jesus did not answer the woman. So his followers came to Jesus and begged him, tell the woman to go away. She is following us and shouting. Jesus answered, 
God sent me only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. Then the woman came to Jesus again and bowed before him and said, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Jesus answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. The woman said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. I will do what you asked. And at that moment, the woman's daughter was healed. Let us pray. I need thee. Oh, Lord, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. So, Lord, I come to you in this moment thanking you for this opportunity to get this thing right. Touch now, Lord. Speak now, Lord, so that your people receive a word from you, God, that their spirits might be inspired, their hearts healed, their minds at peace, and that they will give you glory. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, my everything. In Jesus' name, amen. For the moments we have today, I would like to share, teach, and preach in support of the subject, It's in Your Faith. It's in your faith. From biblical narratives to CNN breaking news, the love, actions, and attitudes of mothers throughout history have been celebrated and ridiculed, applauded and criticized, imitated and disavowed. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, a mother who witnessed a strange man pull her daughter, her five-year-old daughter, into his car, expeditiously hopped into her vehicle, pursued and then rammed the abductor's car. With this act of fearless pursuit, her daughter was rescued and the assailant was caught and arrested. All because this mother made the choice to risk life and limb to save her little girl and prevent her from becoming a statistic. Toya Graham, the mother who was caught on camera a few years back, she confronted, snatched, slapped, and verbally checked her son after she caught him actively participating in the Baltimore riots. She was hailed by some as mother of the year, while others proceeded to file child abuse charges on this mother on this mother who had simply made up in her mind that she would, by any means necessary, protect her baby, correct his behavior, and prevent her only son from becoming a statistic. And perhaps the most unbelievable act of hero heroinism, I have a hard time with that word, that I personally have ever heard occurred in 1982 in the small town of Lawrenceville, Georgia. Tony, Angela's son, was working on his 1964 Chevy Impala when it came off the jacks and collapsed on top of him. Angela acted quickly, and without hesitation, this middle-aged woman lifted the car about four inches and held it there while neighbors pulled her son out of harm's way. Only God knows how she was able to lift a 3,300 pound car off her son. Some said it was physical adrenaline, 
Others argued it was emotional strength that empowered her to achieve such a feat. But what I found most inspiring is how Angela dismissed everyone else's justification for the act, and she said it was prayer. Look at somebody and tell them she did what she did to save her child. I don't hear nobody talking. She did what she did to save her child. Today, church, we gather to give God praise for mothers and to honor mothers like those mentioned just moments ago. Mothers whose love and genuine concern for their children extend far beyond simply meeting their physical needs. I am talking about the mother who started the side hustle to cover the cost of your tutoring lessons so that you will have a better chance for a prosperous future. The mother who robs Peter to pay Paul and then only to give Paul half of what he's owed so that you can have spending money for the field trip. I am talking about the mother who went without so that we, you and me, could have clean clothes, shoes that fit, home-cooked meals, and a comfortable place to lay our heads. Mothers, the mothers who wiped your nose, changed your diapers, and every now and then she would take a little spit uh -huh, from her mouth to remove the ash from your face. Do I have any witnesses in this place? I'm talking about mothers. I'm talking about the mothers who by any means necessary will go above and beyond, beneath and over, around and about, and sometimes through to ensure the welfare of her children. Mothers who do the extraordinary and put sacrifice over self because of the love she has for her children. The woman in our text today is one such mother. Her story is as inspiring as it is powerful and it is recounted in the book of Mark and Matthew. Both authors make it clear that the woman in the story is a Gentile or non-Jew. Matthew labels her a Canaanite, while Mark calls her a Syrophoenician. Gentile, Canaanite, and Syrophoenician are all relevant to her nationality and religious tradition. Because anyone who was not a Jew was called a Greek, or a Gentile. The terms Syrophoenician and Canaanite give insight into her nationality and origin, respectively. Now, at the onset of their accounts, both Mark and Matthew apply these cultural labels, which at first may seem irrelevant. However, it is because of these cultural and social labels coupled with their, her actions that her story is profoundly encouraging for those who have ever been marginalized or ostracized, pushed aside or held down, devalued or dismissed, simply because somebody slapped a label on you and said you weren't good enough. This is how Gentiles were viewed by the spiritual leaders and Jewish persons in neighboring lands. Why? Because Gentiles were idolaters. They worshiped statues of the sun god called Baal and presented human sacrifices to their god. It is for this reason that Jews labeled everyone who was not of the Jewish faith to be unclean term used to describe people who rejected Jewish law and Jewish traditions of worship. And because Gentiles were unclean, Jews believed Gentiles were unworthy of forgiveness and salvation, thereby making her story all the more unique and her actions heroic as this mother who was not deemed important enough to call her by name, uh, sets out perhaps unknowingly, to break through ethnocentric barriers, change perceptions, and get justice for her daughter. Isn't that just like a mother? <laughs> if she has to crawl to the end of the earth, <laughs> hitchhike to the moon, 
stomp the heads of vipers, knock down stone and forced walls, or T-bone the car of her child's abductor. A mother, even with all odds stacked against her, would do all this and more for the betterment of her children. Oh, come on, can the truth get an amen in this place? Though not far removed from what we ex are experiencing today in the 21st century, with the passing of laws designed to strip women of the right to make decisions regarding our bodies. This narrative occurs in a period of antiquity when women were forced into silence and submission via the implementation of man-made laws and the cultural acceptance of those chauvinistic laws. Women were forbidden to initiate attention from men, but she set out to find Jesus. Women were taught to be quiet and passive, but she went about calling and shouting out to Jesus. Though her mission was risky and her behavior unlawful, her courageous determination was unmatched. And so now here she is, within earshot of the one she heard about. And she cries out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Her use of the messianic term, son of David, reveals her exposure and knowledge of Old Testament teaching and implies she likely believes in the validity of Old Testament prophecy found in the book of Isaiah, which foretold of a coming Messiah. This is significant, church, because unlike many Jews of that day, her actions lend to the notion that she, a non-Jewish person, believes Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy and outwardly affirms him as such. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me is a plea for compassion and forgiveness. With these words, she again reveals her belief in Jesus' power to not only do what she is requesting, but this request for mercy affirms her belief in Jesus as one who has the power to forgive and ease all her woes. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter has a demon and she is suffering very much. Believing that Jesus is a man of compassion and love, she lays it all out for him. She lays it all out and I believe she's saying to herself, I'm, I'm not here for me. I've come because my daughter needs what only you can give. And yet Jesus replies with silence. Silence. He uttered not a word. Silence. Have you been there? When you called out to the Lord, laid your burdens at the altar, laying prostrate before the Lord and cried at his feet, begged for mercy, pled for resolution, and all you got in return was silence? Oh, how ironic that the one the apostle John identified as the word who was in the beginning offered no words of any kind to this woman. Just silence. Do you feel it? Silence. Silence used in this manner is powerful. Silence. Silence makes those of ill intent uncomfortable. <laughs> silence. After all she has sacrificed and overcome in pursuit of Jesus, exposing her daughter's affliction and making herself vulnerable to humiliation and scorn, she is now faced with 
silence. A silence that comes across as dismissive. And at first glance, I, I too, I, I struggle to believe that my Jesus, my loving, kind, selfless Jesus would treat this mother or anyone in this way. I, I struggle to understand. And as I sat with the text, reading and rereading this verse, it came to me a question. Could it be that the silence was a test to assess the depth of her faith? Mm. Keep in mind that silence, when used at the right time, is powerful. If you stay quiet long enough, you will quickly learn who your friends are and who your enemies are not. Jesus is silent. And if you are anything like me, you, you want to know why. If we consider the earlier portion of this chapter, the verses preceding this story, it may help us to better understand why Jesus chose silence in that moment. First, remember or understand that prior to arriving in the region of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus was in the land of the Jews. There he was casting out demons, healing the sick, preaching, teaching, and feeding the hungry with two fish and five loaves of bread. Regardless of how much good he did, Jesus was consistently confronted and questioned about his teaching and his supernatural acts by the spiritual leaders of the region. In the place where folk worshiped in synagogues and learned the scriptures of Old Testament prophets, Jesus was scrutinized, antagonized, and relentlessly threatened with a death sentence. He left that region seeking respite in the lands of Tyre and Sidon. However, before he could get situated, here comes this Gentile woman, this mother petitioning him on behalf of her sick child. She knows scripture, she calls him Lord, and affirms him as the descendant of King David. She seems to have more faith than all of the Jews combined. And still, his response is silence. With that, we can only speculate, as the text does not share the rationale for the silence. Perhaps it was just a test. A test that by my personal standards, again, my personal standards, by personal standards, she passed with flying colors. Because what I like about this mother is that she was not deterred by the silence. Oh, that's a message for somebody right there. <laughs> she kept right on calling out to Jesus. So much so that his disciples had had enough and begged him to, in verse 23, tell the woman to go away. She is following us and shouting. She is loud and unrelenting in her cries. Didn't we come here to rest, to get away from the crowds? Yet here she is stirring up a ruckus. Oh, she was stirring up a ruckus. Sometimes, mothers, you got to stir up a ruckus in the midst of the silence. Do I have any witnesses in the place? Stir up a ruckus. You see, I don't, I don't know who this is for today, but I need you to understand that you do not allow the silence to silence you. Let us sit there for just for a moment. Don't let the silence silence you. Instead, make some noise. Stir up a ruckus until your prayers are answered. Stir up a ruckus, single mother, when your requests for a raise go unanswered on your job. Stir up a ruckus when wayward attitudes show up in your teenage children. Sometimes, church, it becomes necessary to stir up a ruckus, fall on your knees and make some noise until your prayers are answered and your situation changes. 
Somebody shout, stir up a ruckus. Stir up a ruckus. Y'all ain't even said that loud enough. Stir up a ruckus. Jesus is silent. The mother is making noise. And the disciples have decided to speak up on the woman's behalf and told Jesus to send her away. However, it is Jesus' response which informs us that her ask was that their ask was twofold. Yes, they wanted her to stop following them and crying out to Jesus. However, they also suggested that Jesus give her what she wants so that she will go away. Do you see it? It's in the text. But see, Jesus was not interested in sending her away and said, God sent me only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. And with that, she went to him, knelt before him and cried out in desperation, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. <laughs> Lord, help me. A short three-word prayer to reiterate her need for help with a problem that only he could resolve. Though it is believed that Jesus was moved by her persistence and unwavering faith, Jesus continued to test, to test her and responded not with words from his own heart or mind, but he uses the language which is commonly used by Jewish people when referring to non-Jews and he states, it is not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Where children refers to the Jewish nation of Israel and dogs refers to the Gentiles who the Jews held in contempt for their idol worship and perceived impurity. In essence, church, Jesus called this mother a dog. Hmm. However, she proved <laughs> just how formidable she was and took, turned the other cheek to a whole new level, demonstrating once again that she would not take no for an answer as she clapped back at Jesus with, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. In other words, this Gentile mother who had served man-made idols and worshiped a sun god all of her life had so much confidence in Jesus' ability to heal her daughter that she was willing to wait for the crumbs to hit the floor. She was willing to wait for the leftover blessings. And if I may translate her response for the 21st century, I believe it might go something like this. I shall not be moved. Oh, no. I ain't going nowhere. If crumbs are what you are offering, then crumbs are what I will take. I can work with the crumbs because I know that the crumbs which fall from your table, Jesus, will be more than enough. The crumbs I find beneath the master's table would be more than enough. Bethlehem, are you willing to wait for the crumbs? Oh, I don't hear nobody saying nothing here. Are you willi willing to wait for the crumbs? Humble yourself for the crumbs. Scrape the floor for the crumbs. I don't know how you all feel about it, but I say, pass the crumbs. Huh. Pass the crumbs. This Gentile mother replied to Jesus with confidence. Even the dogs, she said, eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. 
And it is here that her faith is confirmed and her faithfulness is rewarded. All because she understood the assignment, kept the faith, and refused to take no for an answer. I'm about to get out y'all's way. Y'all ain't hollering enough for me up in this place. Hey, hey. Oh, but wait, church. Wait, 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 wait. The story does not stop right there. As Jesus in verse 28 gives us a reason to shout. He said, woman, you have great faith. I will do what you asked. And at that moment, the woman's daughter was healed. Woman, you have great faith. Because of your faith, I will do what you have asked. At that moment, the woman's daughter was healed. It was her faith. Her faith is what produced the blessing. That's something for somebody today. You got to know that your faith is what produces the blessing. It did not matter how far she came, how much she shouted, the ministry she served on, or how well she sang in the choir. It was her faith. But the prayers of this mother were answered because she was unwavering in her faith. Blessings are born out of our faith. And the second part of the blessing church, just in case you missed it, is that the text says, at that moment, her daughter was healed. Her faith expedited the blessing. Keep in mind that earlier she was all set to accept leftovers the crumbs on the floor. But Jesus rewards her great faith with an expeditious healing, a right now healing. Oh, that's for, some, that's for somebody in here. Come on, somebody. Expeditious healing because of her faith. Church, it is my hope, and I pray with my whole heart that you will allow this message of hope, expectation, and faith to be an inspiration to you and encourage you to put your trust in Jesus. Never give up. Pray without ceasing. And keep your shouting shoes on. But when God blesses you, go ahead and shout. When God touches you, go ahead and shout. When God anoints you, go ahead and shout. When God points you in the right direction, go ahead and shout. Keep your shouting shoes on. And when God blesses you, don't, 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 don't keep it to yourself. Go ahead, share the good news. Because if God will do it for you, God will do it for somebody else. And if God will do it for somebody else, God will do it for you, <laughs> for you. For you, 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 and you, God will do just what he said. And church, I can only imagine that her daughter was at home. <laughs> to figure out, trying to figure out what happened. Perhaps she looked around for her mother and began to feel good <laughs> on the inside as the power of God stepped in and kicked that old demon right out. And as she reveled church in the joy of being free and delighted in knowing that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. For I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life, 
of whom shall I be afraid? And as she went on, praising God for deliverance, I believe this daughter came to understand through divine intervention all that had happened to her and on her behalf. And as she pondered the love of her mother, the determination of her mother, the humility, persistence, and faith of her mother, I believe, church, a song formed in her heart. And she quick, and it quickly processed from her lips as she shed tears of joy for her mother's sacrifice. And if I had to guess or think just what her song was, I believe it might go with something like this. Will you help me today? My mother prayed for me. Come on, church. Had me on her mind. Took the time and prayed for me. Are you glad? I'm so glad she prayed. Come on. I'm so glad she prayed. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. My mother prayed for me uh -huh. had me on her mind took the time and prayed for me I'm so glad she prayed I'm so glad she prayed I'm so glad she prayed for me my mother prayed for me had me on her mind Took the time and prayed for me. I'm so glad she prayed. I'm so glad she prayed. I'm so glad she prayed for me. The pastor prayed. The pastor prayed for me. This is our call to work. The gospel has been preached. Gospel has been preached in need of reminder that your strength can be renewed. Mothers, as you go through, and mothers do go through over and over again, and it seems that God is silent. But God hears, God knows, and God responds. In that, we can all rejoice. Well, all others here, if you seek to know more about this Lord that we celebrate, if you seek to understand, if you seek to understand why what Jesus did for us on the cross is so important every day, if you understand that and that he gave his life for us, that he rose again, we welcome you as a part of this fellowship. The doors of the church are open. If you can confess today that I believe in the Father and the Son and the Son crucified and then lifted up and is in heaven waiting for us. If you believe on those things, we welcome you as a part of this church. If you're here today, would you come? Seeking a place where you might work, grow, be a part of a family that is growing to be all that God has called us to be. Is there one today? Is there one? Jesus. Is there one today? Oh, 
presentations. Would you please come forward? What a wonderful word. We actually have this goodie bag for you. It has a corsage in it and a lot of other good, wonderful things from the committee. Thank you again. Well, church, you may not have known that we actually have six mothers in our church that was born in 1931 and 32. Six. We are blessed to have six wonderful women of God in their 90s. Um, we have um, Pauline Wright, Sister Sister Wright is 93. She became 93 January 15, 1931. We have Sister Mitty Lee, also 93. She was born a couple months after Sister Wright. We have Sister Essie Gray, 92. Sister Marion Benjamin, 92. Sir, um, Sister Loretta Brown, 92. And someone very, very special to me, Sister Rosa McGill, 91. Um, due to the technical difficulties, the engraved um, commemoration gift is not here yet. It will be here Wednesday at the in-person Bible study, and, and I'll make sure that everybody gets their beautiful gift. It's really pretty. I know you're going to love it. <laughs> I'd just also like to thank my wonderful committee. Um, for helping me and for all the what they've done. If they're here, if they could just stand for a moment. Deaconess Webster was Reverend Ford, my cousin, she's not here, and also um, Miss Pitts. So we just like to thank you. Thank you for a wonderful uh, Mother's Day celebration. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday for the in-person Bible study. And um, next Sunday, we're going to have another beautiful Women's Day celebration. Thank you so much, and have a good day. Praise the Lord, saints of God. By the time it's all over, y'all going to learn me. Praise the Lord, saints of God. Amen, amen, amen. We just give God honor and praise. So as we prepare for the benediction, just to confirm, do we sing a song first? Do we all sing first? Oh, sorry. oh okay, she, he said it's up to me. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Please stand prepared for the benediction.
mother prayed. And she prayed with great faith. It's because of her great faith that her daughter was healed expeditiously. And we sang, my mother prayed for me, had me on her mind, took the time and prayed for me. But maybe she sang, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Where would I? One more time. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me. the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of you henceforth, now, and forevermore. Let all of God's people say amen, 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 amen. amen again. Go in peace and have a powerful week. <laughs>